recording. Give it a brief second or two. Got to love today. It's so beautiful out. We're stuck inside learning about identify basic facts about principles, capabilities, and limitations of satellite transmit and receive systems. So what is the bottom line as far as how many that you can miss on this test? Twelve. 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 Just to pass. All right. Twelve too many, sir. Well, I would like to see every one of you guys get a hundred. I've not seen that in a class, but I would uh, love to see I'm it. Scared. <laughs> Too easy, sir. Uh, I've had, I think, two classes that got really good scores, but most of them were in that 98. There was a couple of hundreds. Ended up that class had a, like a 97% average, and there was 12 of them. So hang on just a second. Let me put this on mute and remedy the problem here. Hang on. Yeah, Quiznos. Woof. Quiznos. 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 Tell the bell, tell the bell. Tell the bell, give me a shot right now. Yeah. Totally, Bill. Give me a shout out. You can, uh, just put the shade down. Shout please. out to Millie. <laughs> Yo, give us a give it. Say something, Totally, Bill. Give us something to hear. Totally, give me a shout out. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, Totally, Bill. Totally, Bill. Hey, uh, can y'all keep it down? I'm trying to learn. You guys oh, are funny, you sir. We're just interacting with the group. Okay. Yeah, you're uh, getting familiar with each other, correct? Been familiar. Getting to know each other. We're, we're best friends. <laughs> okay. We know each other too well. Too well. Except for Horace. I don't. Except know. for Carlos. Yeah. Well, anyway, just uh, stuff like this happens every now and then, and doggone it, get it, doggone it. I've got. Uh, uh -huh. Two dogs in here. One of them decided to go nuts because the windows are open in this beautiful open air scenario where we can get a good breeze going through. And I guess he saw one of the neighbor's dogs and decided he was going to go nuts. You were just saying hi to the neighbor. Yeah, I know. Let's try this again. <laughs> All right. So identify basic facts about the basic... Principles, capabilities, limitations of satellite transmit and receive systems. The AFSC application. Let's take a look at this. What are you going to do? Well, there's a very good possibility when you get out in the field, you're going to be working with satellite equipment. So this is the precursor to it in where we lay out our foundations of how the satellite systems are looked at. When you get into starting in block eight, which I think it's block nine now, and then in block nine, which is block 10, that's a GMT. The first one you're going to hit is, uh, you know, once you get through with this class, is the PRIC 117 Golf. It is SATCOM friendly. That is a basically man pack SATCOM radio. The next class that you'll go to is the actual set up a major GMT satellite system. So you, you for the next couple blocks, this is what you're going to see. When we look at the transmit and receive systems overview, we're looking at the basic radio picture. In other words, we're painting the easy one. Then we're going to go to radio fundamentals and look at performance assessment as well as ancillary functions that are on these devices. So without further ado, you guys should have access to this basic radio picture here. Do you have the handouts? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, you can fill this out along the way or 
you can wait until I get to the picture where it fills everything out for you and you can fill it out at that point. It's a very good reference with each of those blocks and what they do. So I suggest it's a great way to put notes on that handout for you to go over at a later time frame. So let's look at the objective on our transmit path. Now, if we take a look at this, the transmit path is, let me get this out and select this line right here. Let me give it some weight. Let me do this even better. Let's go with this. So you understand which one's what, correct? You got the transmit on the top side of that red line you have receive on the bottom side so are these two different locations are they two different locations yeah or like you have the transmitter at one place and the receiver maybe like okay on another base. now <laughs> that's a very good question but the way our systems work is a full duplex system so you actually have a transmitter and receiver in one box. At the satellite that's up in the air, it also has a transmitter and receiver. And then when you get to the distant end, it also has a transmitter and receiver. So you're constantly receiving and transmitting data and there is no stopping it unless one side goes out. So yes, this is all in one box at your location. That makes sense now to you there? Crystal clear. All right. This is not a half duplex like a transceiver where you got a kit and then you got a release for them to talk to. No, this is like a cell phone. The difference is, is now you're sending and receiving lots amount of data. So with this transmit baseband to the distant end, we're going to do it in three different steps. One is modulation, the second one is up conversion, and the other one is going to be amplification. Now with that in mind, the first step is your modulator. The modulator is this device right here. Okay? This is your baseband right here, and this is your modulator that we're talking about. So the three steps that we're going over is modulation, up conversion, amplification. So the modulator is going to convert the baseband to what's called an IF, which is an intermediate frequency. Depending on the equipment, it can go anywhere from 70 megahertz all the way up to 30 gigahertz. And it again, it depends on the system itself. Up converter. This is where we take the IF and end up making it in, into the operating frequency. It relies on a local oscillator, hmm, which relies on phase lock loop to keep it on frequency. And that's how the RF is made. And we're going to get to that when we get into the TIS here, and I can show you the breakouts of this basic radio picture when we get to the C's and D's. We're going to end up at the high power to amplifier and then this is going to take that RF and amplify it up to the operating frequencies output. It can be anywhere from milliwatts all the way up to watts depending on the equipment. The next step is we're changing gears and going from transmit to receive the difference is, if you look at transmit, receive is the complete opposite. So we're going to recover the baseband. We're going to take 
the signal, we're going to amplify because that's what RF signal recovery means. We're going to down convert it, which is opposite of up conversion, and then we're going to demodulate it into the baseband. Let's look at each one of them. So LNA is low noise amplifier. Big thing is it's very sensitive in finding that signal, and then it's going to amplify it. It's going to eliminate some of the noise and get it up to a usable wattage or milliwatts, microwatts, depending on what the signal needs, and be able to uh, send it over to our down converter. Down converter is going to convert it from RF to IF. And again, it uses the local oscillator in order to make that to happen. The next one, we end up sending it to the demodulator as the IF, and the IF is going to convert it into baseband. And also, I'm going to show you that term AGC is always a receiver term. I have never seen AGC used as a transmit term. Now, what does AGC mean? It's automatic gain control. You guys out there have probably seen it in what, uh, the PRIC 150, right? Yeah, PRIC 150 yeah. uses AGC. <clears throat> and I think it uses TGC for transmit. So what does that mean? It controls, with TGC, it controls the wattage going out and makes sure it's constant. With AGC, it controls the output at the end of the radio, or I should say the beginning of the radio, where you have a constant output for whatever the data is or the audio will be. So with that particular handout that you have, go ahead and take the time and put these in. I'll wait for a, a minute or so. While you guys are looking, I can answer this email real quick. Really? All right. Who does not have this completed? Really? Oh, boy. I always want to put receiver for some reason. <laughs> Close enough, right? Is there anybody that does not have this on? Oh, uh, All right. Let's go ahead and take a look at the next picture. This is the same block diagram, just drawn out a little bit differently. I've got in the red circle, you can see that we have two circles with a sine wave in it. Those are considered local oscillators. They're the ones that are going to give our transmit and receive frequencies either in down conversion or up conversion. Modulators and demodulators, you'll see it's a circle with an X through it. Those are mixers. 
normally either for modulation or heterodyning. That's demodulation. You also do it with the up converter and the down converter. Those are also mixers. <clears throat> and then you got the triangles are always amplifiers. HPA is high powered amplifier, LNA is low powered amplifier. Now, again, you're going to see this a lot in the SATCOM side of the house. This is a branch assembly. It comes right after the HPA and before the LNA. Now, what this branch assembly does is it has no electronics other than they are passive electronic devices. And we're going to go through each one of them here. You'll notice that all of it comes on that big bold line and either is going out the antenna or coming in from the antenna. This branch assembly is very good in determining what is a transmit and what is a receive signal, even though it's passive. So what does it do? Well, it directs microwave energy to and from the antenna, suppresses harmonics. Hmm. Yeah, when we get into the pisser, I'll be able to show you that one. It also does the external noise in eliminating it. Aids in receiver selectivity. Hmm. Sounds like a filter to me, doesn't it? And then it permits monitoring of the output power. You guys have seen this back in the PRIC 150s, where at the end, when it's transmitting out, before it hits that antenna, there is something called a directional coupler, which monitors the output wattage. That output wattage gets controlled if there is a problem. Well, let's look at the first one. It's called an isolator. Notice it's a circle with an arrow in it. That's the way that the RF is going to flow. Any RF that comes back in prevents it from coming in. Think of it as a one-way valve. I'm trying to think of the name in plumbing where there's a one-way uh, valve. Uh, it's eluding me. Anyway, that one-way valve prevents anything from getting back in to damage the equipment. Normally, it's the isolation point where you're going out of the electronic devices into the passive system. The next one is called directional or dual couplers. This one knows, well, actually, you guys, when you guys worked on in block one, you guys used a digital watt meter, didn't you? I think so. Yes, sir. Okay, so the digital watt meter, did you guys notice that there were two elements at the top? And you could... I can't you, say I do. Okay, well, at the top of them, you could actually rotate those. One was pointing toward the dummy load. The other one was pointing uh, away from the dummy load. Well, the one pointing to the dummy load was considered the forward power. The one going away from the dummy load was reflected power. Forward power, good. Reflected power, bad. With that, those are two RF diodes that sit in there and takes the residual RF and measures it, and that's what the digital watt meter does. It shows you a representation of what's going to the dummy load and what's coming back from the dummy load. Those are called directional couplers. With the TISSER or any SATCOM gear or radio gear, what those directional couplers look at is do I have reflected power coming back and also sends out that wattage and signal, those two are, are used in a control circuit. In other words, if you by accident forgot to connect your antenna up and you decide to key up, your radio is probably going to go in prevent mode. Not going to broadcast very well. But it's also going to prevent it from 
burning up because that's what you would end up doing. You would have a severe amount of reflected power coming back. Now, if it's going into the antenna and everything looks good, hopefully you get the full amount of wattage going out. But there is always a possibility that your output wattage could either exceed or not be enough. And that's what the directional coupler would do on the forward side. It would show the dis, you know, what just came out. Hey, I got not enough power, so I need to boost it. If I have too much power, I need to take it down. It works just like an AGC circuit. So the isolator makes sure nothing comes back, and then our directional dual couplers basically monitor it to make sure it's getting enough power. Exactly. And that's going. This particular one is in transmit, so you don't want any reflected come back, and you want to make sure that you have enough wattage going out. Now, if it had too much, now just remember, if it has a lot of reflected coming back, that isolator would prevent any of that RF power from getting into the circuitry. All right, next up we have filters. You guys have seen this a lot along the lines here. The big thing is you can either have a one filter does all, which is a band pass filter, or you can have an adjustable filter. And we're going to go through that when we get into the tisser and show you the adjustable one and a bandpass filter. Next up, we have circulators. Now, circulators can either be two different types, diplexers or duplexers. And if you research this on Google, they actually have either a three-port or four-port circulator. And the way it works is it's looks like a iron core washer with wires wrapped around it and there's you go you got an input output and another port that is i think it's a uh, output also but it knows by the impedance of the frequency which one is transmit and which one is receiving you're going on oh, what well, with SATCOM, Wideband, Tropo, whatever you want to call it, anytime you have a full duplex system, you're going to have a transmit frequency and a receive frequency that are not going to be on the same. Normally, they're about 200 megahertz apart. Yeah, that's a full duplex system. When we look at diplexers, here is a picture of one. And if any of you guys have had like DirecTV or Dish Network, you would know what this is. I don't think I see too many of these running around anymore. I think I've got some old ones up in the attic because I had DirecTV at one point. And this is how you either combine or split apart your satellite from your over-the-air TV. This is also another duplexer. The tin cans on the right, I've worked with those before, and they are really handy when it comes to trying to separate frequencies because you got one trying to bleed over on the other one. We have a circulator. This is what a circulator looks like. There are a four port. Looks, uh, you'll actually have the other port that goes down. You notice that the, the arrow determines you know what which one goes where. Let's look at AGC. AGC, we have this picture called Rago, not ragu like the spaghetti sauce. Rago. What's it stand for? RSL means receive signal level. That's what's coming into our antenna and hitting the front end of our radio to get an output to go to either our earphones or the multiplexer if it's data. AGC and voltage is the voltage that's representing the signal strength of that received signal. Then we have gain. If you've got a weak signal, you want to bring the gain up. If you've got a strong signal, you want to bring the gain down. 
What is the end result? Well, you want an output that is constant. So you can look at each one of those boxes and go through them, which I'm going to do here. RSL in that box off to the left is increasing. AGC would be increasing. But my gain's got to bring it down to give my output constant. And then in reverse, you can see RSL and AGC and voltage are both going down, but I'm going to have to use my gain to bring it up. Output's going to stay the, uh, the same. Now, the background story is why did RSL go up? Well, maybe your antenna dishes were pretty close together. Why did RSL go down? Well, maybe your antenna dishes are far apart. Also, when you are lining up the dishes, more than likely your RSL is going to be very low until you start pointing it at the other dish, and then you're going to increase in your RSL, and then everything follows suit. You can see the three sentences below the boxes, RSL and AGC are directly proportional. RSL and gain are inversely proportional. The object behind AGC is output always remain constant. Just to give you a background on this, it is a term that's used throughout my career. It's always said for a variant RF input, get it, the RSL. You want to use AGC to get a constant output steady now for those of you who don't really truly under understand agc and why we have it well for those of us who worked in the air traffic control environment you got a plane that's 200 miles out that's coming to your base to land their first indication when you when they key up you're going to have now this is if you don't have agc they key up, you can't hear them, so you got to turn that volume all the way up. As they get closer to base, and they start talking to you more and more, you're going to have to start turning that volume down. Holy crap, pretty soon they'll be blasting you out. Well, what AGC does is it takes that volume control away from you and makes it easier to understand, hey, this is a comfortable listening level at all. RF or receive signal levels. So that's what AGC does for us. No, sir. Would that basically be like putting like a cap on the uh, uh, the amplitude of like a wave coming in? Yep. Gotcha. Yeah, and if it doesn't have enough, it's going to amplify it up into where you can. The whole I got it. premise behind it. All right, so we're going to look at these particular names. Look at the terms that they were faced with. And these are all parameters that you're going to see throughout your Air Force career when you start looking at tech orders. Normally in the capabilities and limitations, if there is a tech order or in tech manuals, it's normally specifications. So frequency, accuracy, and stability, this depends on your oscillator. That oscillator is the accuracy of how that frequency is going to stay online and phase lock loop helps it stay online so if you don't have a very good quality oscillator sometimes phase lock loop will help with the accuracy if you got a really good oscillator phase lock loop is just there to correct the small minor changes then we have bandwidth we discussed this earlier about how fast it can be or how wide the band pass is and so forth and so on. It just depends on the equipment that you're using and how it is dictated to you. In other words, bandwidth can be a range of frequencies when we're looking at SATCOM or it can be what is the bandwidth of the hissy or the speed which is 52 megabits per second on the NSM. So those are two different ways of describing it. Oops. Frequency response. This one normally is about an audio device, sometimes a system, 
And the idea behind it is produce or reproduce a signal within a certain tolerance. Then you have selectivity. This one is all about the receive signal. The idea here is I only want a small range of the whole frequency spectrum and I need to reject all the other frequencies. Normally when it comes to receive, you have pre-selection first and then you have overall selectivity about halfway through the radio. We have gain. We looked at the RSL when we had gain. It's either going up or going down depending on what's needed. Sensitivity, how well we can pull that signal out of the noise floor and be able to amplify it and understand it. Systems approach. This is the radio performance assessment. I'm going to just describe this to you and hopefully you can understand this. When you have a system, let's just say it is the Jerk 239. Jerk 239 has a transmit receive in two places. Okay, the object is to get it from point A to point B. All the equipment that's tied into it is someone else's items. And then there's the customer who uses that equipment to get it onto your network or your tisser there and send it to the dis and in, which is the next tisser, and then they break it down and so forth and so on. If you're called out to fix the tisser, and you find out that it is not the tisser, you can't stop there. You need to figure out, well, gee, is it from the multiplexer or is it from the user? Yes, you might have to go ahead and troubleshoot someone else's equipment, but that is the systems approach. And please remember, it is easier to... Get more flies with honey than it is with vinegar. So you can go a long way by being nice and troubleshooting this with the customers, even though it's not your equipment. But once you figure out it's not your equipment, then you can get somebody else on there that has more expertise. Now, I have been in that situation many a time in the past, and it's easier. To one, be nice to the customer and try to figure out where the problem is before it gets to your equipment. And then if you can fix it, that's great. If you can't and you don't know what you're getting into, that's where you call the, the other agency in. So once you are able to do that, sometimes that other agency is really nice to you. And, you know, uh, let's just say you do really have a problem with the tisser and then they reciprocate and be able to assist you out. So it's a team effort when you're nice about the whole thing when it comes to the system. Okay. The next one we look at is performance measure. We look at quality, reliability, and speed. Quality, how close the output resembles the input. Reliability, the percentage of the time that is available. And speed, how quick you can process the data or how quickly you can establish COM. We have auxiliary functions here. We got switching, auxiliary channel, performance monitors, and fault indicators. So let's take a look at each one of them. Switching, that's used for redundancy. We talked about redundancy when it comes to master-slave in our types of network synchronization. That's an example switch from the master clock because it went bye-bye and you go to the next clock. Can switch standby equipment online. Sometimes it takes a physical person in moving and relocating. Auxiliary channel. You're going to hear the word order wire. What does that mean? It means that we, maintenance, has our own channel that's separate from the mission traffic or aggregate or mission bit stream and so forth and so on. 
we have our own channel. Why do we have our own channel? Well, if stuff isn't working, you can't be on the mission traffic if it's going to create problems. So that's the reason why we have our own channel. Performance monitors. Oh boy. And fault indicators. So performance monitors pretty much allows for troubleshoot. What does it mean? Well, on the front panel of the Tisser, we have a meter. The meter shows a little green spot, about yay big. If your needle is not within the green spot, that means you might have a problem. You got to figure it out. So it has upper and lower limits because of it. Also, when you are doing PMIs and you see that there might be some problems when one of those tests does not meet the PMI standard, yeah, it might be a radio getting ready to go on you. And then fault indicators, visual and audible alarms. Of course, this one's pretty easy. Troubleshooting. So you have performance monitors for troubleshooting, fault indicators for troubleshooting. And again, I have been in that situation where, for example, we have single channel receivers and single channel transmitters. And it's real easy to troubleshoot them at O dark 30 in the morning. You do not know how many times I've been out there at that time in the morning. When you've got a radio that supposedly is out, when you walk into the building, you don't turn the lights on. What? You don't turn the lights on? Yep. You look around at all the racks, and you look for the, either the red light, or a light that does not come on. That makes troubleshooting so much easier. Instead of looking at each individual radio, you know, up close, by keeping the lights off, you can identify just through the visual assessment. Because most of the time, troubleshooting is all about the visual. Like somebody forgot to put a switch in a certain position. Or... The light is extinguished and no one saw it. So it's just one of those things. Audible alarms could be a bell. We've had air traffic control consoles back in the day that had bells. So if they blew a fuse, the bell would go off and we would come in and replace the fuse. Pretty easy. So we've gone over the basic radio picture. So I'm going to ask you a few questions. Juarez, what is the basic objective for transmit what is the objective for transmit in a basic radio picture mm, you're not looking for like three steps correct well they involve the three steps but there's a saying for it what is well, the objective? I know transmit like a, a band to the distant end yeah, exactly. That's what I was looking for. So, Marshman, can you tell me the three steps in order? Uh, multiplex, and then modulate to a up converter, and then to the HPA. No, except Maybe. that modulate is where it starts at. All right, Thomas, can you tell me what the objective for receive is? The objective for receive is to recover the baseband. Exactly. Mills, can you tell me what three steps it's done in? You do RF signal recovery, then you down convert, and you demodulate. Wow. Guys are listening. I'm impressed. So what is the key component when we either up convert or down convert? This is an overhead question. What's the key component when we down convert and up convert? Yeah, what key component makes that happen? Let's see a senior Bell or uh, Quinos 
can answer that one. We'll give them an opportunity. I'll even give you guys a hint. Frequency, accuracy, and stability happens there. Anybody? Sir, would that be AGC? Negative. That's what controls the input oh, okay. in the uh, out, output section or input or whatever you want to call it, depending if it's TGC or AGC. That's a control circuit. So, so that, it also so wouldn't be Rego? Negative. Like as a whole? Got it. All right, so let's go back here. So what key component are we looking at that helps with down conversion or up conversion? An oscillator? Yep, exactly. You need an oscillator to do that. <laughs> yep. I ask difficult questions at times. See if you're beginning to understand you know, some of the concepts we've been throwing at you. All right, so we've gone through that one. Let's go to Free Bravo. Identify basic facts and principles, capabilities, and limitations of modems. Everybody knows you got to get 70%. How many do you have to have right to pass? Me too. 28. 28. No, wait, 28. <laughs> 28. <laughs> two. I would like to see everybody get less than two wrong. <laughs> that would be good. All right, so we look at the AFSC application. As you well know, yeah, you're going to be dealing with modems. In fact, you're probably dealing with a modem right now because if you're online with a computer or a phone, you're probably dealing with a modem. When we look at this, we're looking at the general modem principles, Types of modulation, forward air correction, interleaving traditional modems and IP based modems. Let's look at the general principle modems. Okay, so we look at a regular modem. What does it do? Well, it takes a digital signal and it modulates it onto an analog carrier. And then when that carrier gets sent to the distant end, then it's going to demodulate it into the digital information. Kind of wild, isn't it? Wait a minute. Modems are actually analog. Yes. So let me go back in time. How many people remember when we went from an analog TV source to a digital TV. And you had to get the converter boxes if you had the old style tube CRT TVs. I think that happened in 20... Sir, can you repeat the question? Yeah, okay. So, back in the day, in the early, somewhere in the mid 2000s, mid to late 2000s, we, or actually the FCC, said, hey, we're going to transfer all the analog uh, stations into digital stations for TV. And if you had an old style TV, you had to go out and get a converter box that converted the analog to digital. Well, we made that transformation and then the new digital receivers came out in the TVs and that's how we got to the thinner TVs and so forth and so on. New technology. So you guys don't remember that? 
Oh, I remember. I remember, yeah. Okay, because so the old tube TVs, I call them tube, they're actually CRTs. You had to buy a converter box to put it up on top, and it would take the signal. And, of course, everybody came out and said, hey, you have to purchase this digital antenna now. How many people bought a digital antenna? Uh, the people who bought the digital antenna are the ones who, um, I don't know, actually. I, was, I just wanted to talk. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's fine, Juarez. Uh, so, but I remember, though. I remember when I was a kid. And okay, my friends so about it. any place that you went, let's just say you went to Walmart when the new digital stuff came out, and you had to buy, because that was a selling point, a digital TV antenna. <sighs> nope. You didn't have to, because your same rabbit ears would pick up that analog signal. The way digital TV works is they convert it. You know, when they're filming it, it gets converted into a digital signal, gets modulated on an analog carrier, and then sent out over the airways. It's when it comes back in, that's that converter box. When it comes in, it converts the analog into a digital signal back into an analog to get it back to your TV if you had an analog TV. Nowadays, it goes, when it gets received, it comes into a digital receiver, and it's easier to do pixels now than it is anything else and of course the audio is still analog so it converts all that digital information you remember PCM there you go that's on the analog side where the audio is video all digital all done by so the those TVs they have they have the box like built into it already yep and uh, the biggest thing on there is a uh, oh geez was a circuit card about that big. The rest of it is just nothing but a TV. They've gone to these mi micro chips, so to speak, and it just fits on that little piece of paper I showed you. It is ridiculous. That's the advent of doing digital now. It's easier to transfer digital information, and it is not as easily corrupted when it gets modulated. And that's what modems do. When you're doing TV signals, it acts just like that modem when it puts it out over the airwaves. So, without further ado, let's take a look at some more information about modem principles. Baud rate, okay, known as bandwidth per second, known as a symbol too. Now, the big thing here is depends on the modulation technique determines how that baud rate is figured. Okay, and we're getting into that. Bit rate versus baud rate. There's eight bits in a word. Baud rate is bigger. Uh, disregard that. Bits, when you come right down to it, if you calculate all the bits that are in a baud rate, it is huge. Baud rate is smaller than a bit would be. Bits are, <laughs> let's try this again. You got eight bits, which could be one baud. Start to see the picture. So if I had two baud, that would be 16 bits. All right. Now, when you take a look at that bottom line, it says as many as 10 bits per symbol today, it's significant more. Way more than that now. This was taken probably about 2010 or 12 in when this baud rate came to being. Let's take a look at each one of these three here as far as types of modulation. You got frequency, amplitude, and phase when we're talking about a modem. You can also apply this to radios. In the PRIC 113, you have a modem in it that can utilize this information and send it out over the airwaves. 
Let's take a look at each one of them. The frequency shift keying is the earliest type. This is your ones and zeros. The easiest way to do it would would explain like teletype machines. Da 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 da. Uh, when they were doing, you know, when railroads they had all that uh, those power lines through there that they would use the teletypes with. Basically, it was Diddy Bop is what we call it in the ham world. Diddy Bop being the Morse code. You got dots and dashes. So that's the way they figured it out. Now, this is only one bit per symbol. What does it mean? It means you either get a logic of one on one frequency or a logic of zero with a different frequency. Let's take a look at our diagram here. You can see the signal format at the top, and you can see the frequency down below. And I'm going from right to left. You can see we have a 1. It looks like it's a higher frequency. So when it gets to a 0, it goes to a lower frequency. You start to see the picture. 1s are higher frequency. 0s are lower frequency. It makes sense to me. And it looks like it's an NRZ format, doesn't it? ones and zeros. Nothing changes halfway through the clock cycle. <laughs> uh, going back in time, aren't I? Next one, we have amplitude. Amplitude shift keying modulates only the amplitude of the carrier. What does that mean? One amplitude is a logic one, another amplitude is a logic zero. What you designate will determine that. So let's look at this is being one bit per symbol. Again, it's either a one or a zero. Here's the picture. You can see logic levels of ones are higher amplitude. You can see logic levels of zero, a lower amplitude. Then we get into phase. Before I get into phase, let's go ahead, take a five minute break and come back at I got 132 let's come back at 137 all right yes, sir. Yes, sir.
two. All right, <clears throat> Mills, you back? Yes, yes, sir. All right, Stevens, you back? Stevens, Juarez, I'm here, sir. Marshman, yes, sir. Thomas, me, damn, damn. And I see Quiznos and then uh, Bell, you there? You back, Bell? Back, Bell. <laughs> Good. Stevens, you back? Stevens. Bell, if you can, go ahead and put it in chat. Interesting. Okay, so okay, can I can now. Good job, Bell. Uh -huh. Are you back? Yeah, he's using his phone. All right, we'll have to continue on without him. All right. May he rest in peace. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Say his name twice for it to work. Bell, Bell? Is that the, what it is? Holy Bell, Holy Bell. Ah. Uh. Okay. We left off with phase shift. King. This one has, you know, they all have a history to it, but this one is where we start getting into some pretty good numbers as far as symbols. <clears throat> Let's take a look at each one of them. We've got binary phase shift king and we have quadrature phase shift king. I can see Bell's trying to get back on. <clears throat> so binary shift king means that we are shifting the analog signal when it comes to the states. What does it mean by a phase shift? Well, if you got a logic one followed by a logic one, nothing happens. Same with the logic zero with the logic zero. You get a 180 degree shift when you change the logics like a 1 to a 0 or a 0 to a 1, this is 1 bit per symbol. Okay? This is how it works. Anytime you see a logic of 1 and it changes into a 0, you will see a 180 degrees phase shift. 
Same with when you go from a zero to a one, you will see the 180 degrees phase shift. It's when you start getting into quadrature, this is where it starts shifting two signals. So you modulate two signals onto a carrier wave, and it shifts the same amount, except one is going to do one thing, the other is going to do another thing. And you notice that it's two bits per symbol. This is quadrature. Quadrature meaning that there are two signals, and you're getting four different results. You can have 0, 0, a 0, 1, a 1, 0, or a 1, 1. That's, even though that's four different types, it's two bits per symbol. This is the start. Question. Go ahead. So how does a phase shift key differentiate from signal points? It seems like both of them are dealing with ones and zeros. I, I'm sorry. I did, I got the binary phase shift, but I didn't hear you compare it to what was the other one. So with signal forming like NRZ and RZ, that deals with ones and zeros as well. How is phase shift key different? Okay. The signal format that you're sending it could be NRZ. And these are the ones and zeros that it represents. Okay, so this is what goes into it. Yes. This is what goes into a transmitter, and we're modulating it with this phase shift. In this case, when we're looking at quadratures, we're doing two signals that's going in there. Not one. Not shifting the frequency, not uh, varying the amplitude. This one, we're using the phase shift of the two analog signals that go in there. Okay. Okay. Oh, it gets funner after that. So this is two bits per symbol. So the first three, which were frequency, amplitude, and phase, which is binary phase, those are all one bit per symbol. It was either logic of one or logic of zero. With quadrature, this is where it became, becomes two bits per symbol. It's when you get in the quam, does this get ridiculous? What you see is a four bit per symbol representation. Quam is not, uh, quam can be as high right now, and I've seen it go all the way up to 128. They're working on 256. What is it? And the next one is 512. So, and I think that has everything to do with what's represented with a 4K TV and a 10K TV. There's other ways that we send data out through the RF like this, such as <laughs> some of our newer pieces of equipment, like the P2P has QAM on it. This one that you see, again, is four bits per symbol. You'll see that we've got it divided in four quadrants. Each one of them has two, uh, one signal or two signals per, and it can get a little wild. So this is a disregard. That's an eight bit per symbol scenario. Again, it can get all the way up to as high as you have, you know, the capabilities. Now, I do know this for a fact. The more symbols that you have in QAM, you start to run the risk of what's called bleed over. In other words, you get, you see that it's in four quadrants. Right now, it's pretty easy to do those signals in those quadrants. But when you start adding more and more numbers in there, there is a very good chance that one might skip over into the other quadrant. And that's the problem that you see when you start getting into 256 and 512 right now. They, they know how to do it in keeping it from doing it. It's just that they're trying to develop the technology where it's consistent 
where it's not getting in there. Now that would be called an error bit if it went over into the other quadrant. Because the other quadrant would see it and say, hey, wait a minute, instead of eight bits uh, per symbol on this one side, I now see nine bits. And they're going, oh, that's not good. That's not good. And it creates problems for the other side. So that's quadrature. And I just gave you some gee whiz information. So what do you need to know about quadrature? That's when you start increasing the bits per symbol. And it gets crazy with that one. First three, frequency, amplitude, and binary are all how many symbols? Bits per symbol? Two. One. Oh, one. One. What's quadrature? Three. Two. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, for two. Oh, let's, let's try quam. <laughs> three. Three. Yeah, three or more. <laughs> uh, hey, I. What was the word before quad? Okay, you had quadrature. When you start seeing the Q, that's that's your Q to say, hey, that's more than two bit, you know, two bits or more. So anything with a Q for you know, like quadrature, amplitude, shift king, yeah, that's uh. Two bits, and then we need it to uh, quam. It's yeah, crazy. So one bit versus two or more. Okay, now why in the world would we get to that? Well, it's coming up here. First, we're going to talk about forward air correction. Okay, that's a new term, isn't it? What is forward air correction? Well, first of all, you're going to send information down the line. And when it gets to the distant end, it is very possible that the distant end, when it received it, there may be some errors in that transmission. With forward air correction, you're able to send an extra bit of information that might help be able to put it at the distant end. So it is basically, and everybody's probably watched this before, Wheel of Fortune. Who hasn't? Yes, sir. Yeah, who hasn't watched Wheel of Fortune? Spin the wheel. Yeah. Well, what happens with Wheel of Fortune at the end is they have the winning contestant come up. They are allowed to uh, they get the, I think it's what, three constants and one valve. So they get to have three constants and one valve. And they're putting that word together. And hopefully, when they give that last set of vowels and constants, they're able to be able to determine what that word is or phrase. Well, same with forward air correction. That's the whole idea of being able to put it together at the distant end. And there is a mathematical way of doing it called Hamming code. Now, the forward air correction rates, the easiest way to do this is remember, the transmit is going to send the error code. The distant end puts it all together. They are the contestant where they got to figure out what the word is. The way they send this is in these particular numbers. You got a half, you got three quarters, you got two thirds, five, six, seven, eights. Okay, what does that mean? Well, let's choose a seven, eight one. What they are doing is they're sending eight bits of information to you. Seven of them are the intelligence. The eighth bit is the error code. If they send you five six, that means they're going to send you six bits of information. The five bits will be the information, and the sixth bit is the error code. Two thirds. They're sending you three bits of information. Two bits of it is the intelligence. The third bit is the error bit. Seems to me that you're able to put it together with the smaller bit. Uh, 
smaller amount of bits than the larger amount of bits. But it has everything to do with the internet and how they're sending it or out over the airways. Over the airways, you got issues because you got interference all the time or some type of noise and so forth and so on. So forward air correction is a big thing when it comes to, let's say, Wi-Fi or cell phones or you know things like that. So forward air correction, they send these numbers, they put it together at the dis and in. This is where we have data rate, modulation type that we just went over, and forward air correction. We put all of these together, and we come up with an overall system baud rate or symbol rate. Let's look at the big picture here, and you can see that all three of these are being utilized to figure out what the baud rate is. So if I had a data rate of 5, 12 megabits per second, depending on the forward air correction, because that's going to be overhead, then you're going to see how much the modulation is going to be as far as the type. Remember that anything with a Q in it is going to be two or more. And with that in mind, you know, if it is some type of quadrature, your data rates instead of being 5, 12, probably going to be way up there around one point two or one point five in there. So it's just a, uh, an interesting concept and how they're able to put all this together and give you a baud rate or symbol rate. Interleaving, not interweaving or inter whatever. Interleaving is a form of FEC. Or air correction. The difference is instead of sending only a bit, it sends blocks and it's easier to lose a bit from a block than it is the whole thing. So interleaving is one of those forms of port air correction. And if you were to research this, you could open up a whole can of worms and go down that deep, dark rabbit hole. So we just keep it simple. Interleaving is a form of forward air correction. Next up, we have telephone modem types. We have the telephone itself. And I've heard AT&T on a couple occasions, their technician, they'll always talk about it. Gee, this person had an old, uh, a POTS on them, and I'm like, oh, plain old telephone system. They still have them around? Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. And I'm jealous because my mom's got fiber in the middle of nowhere. Of course, she's in a rural area. And I'm in the city, and I can't even get fiber to my house. Makes everybody angry here. Then they have satellite modem. That one, you know, if you've had DirecTV, it was a huge satellite system. That's what they use the internet for. Talk about slow. Now, with ours, with the Air Force, we're, we're a lot more faster than that. We have fiber optic modem. There are... Very high data rates with this one. The nice thing is, is you can't get electromagnetic interferences on it very well. In other words, an EMP pulse, eh. There are five stages to it. You got a modulator, transmitter, receiver, filter, and demodulator. When we look at IP based modems, this one is what you guys probably have in the dorms. If not, you can probably go wired and get it straight into the multiplexer, which would be faster. There is a video out on Linus Tech Tips that show the differences between why is your Wi-Fi slower than your wired connection, and it is very good. So I highly encourage you to Take a look at that. Linus Tech Tips. 
Here's another IP-based modem. It's an iDirect. See that right above me? Right below the three cases? That's an iDirect modem. Well, where is that? Well, it's in room 116. It's off to the left. If it was on, you would know it because it's just as loud as those three cases when they're powered up. It's loud. Yep, it is very loud. Anytime you're in room 116, I encourage you to wear hearing protection. Normally when I'm in there with uh, the students, back in the day, oh my goodness, I would literally have to put in some uh, you know the ear protection you can't put in headphones it's not allowed because it's not authorized it you have to use the hearing protection segment they won't let you wear earplugs unless it is Air Force directed training it's the only time you can wear it TDMA is what they use if it was FDMA they would need more in order to use it so they use TDMA and the iDirect. Here's what the information on your frequency bands you have C band, X band, KU band, and KA band. You can see the throughput is about 4.2 meg. On downlink it's about 18 meg which is pretty interesting. Now let's take a look at that those operating bands again. C band, X band, KU, and KA band. C band starts about 1.5 gigahertz and up. X band somewhere in the 5 gig. KU, I want to say it's in that 10 to 15 gig. KA is in the 30 to 40 gig. I think it's been a while since I looked all that up. There is a K band in there. Well, KU means under the K band and KA means it's above the K band. You can look this up on the ITU or the IEEE websites to find the operational bands for in this case satellite modems. So you can see that it uh, does have some significant frequency range up in there. Now, Sergeant Young told me an easy way of uh, how he gets his students to remember the four bands that the iDirect modem is on. And he always says, hey, start it off with a K-pop band. You know, the CX Kuka band. Get it? No? No one knows what a K-pop band so is? Sorry, K. Do you know what a K-pop band is? Korean pop. Korean. Korean boy bands, so to speak. Kind of like NSYNC and Backstreet Boys and all those guys back in the day. So, CX is the first initials of the Kuka band. That's the way he explained it to me. And it stuck. It seemed like I can remember it whenever I think of the K pop band scenario. So, who's first? Run that by me again there, Aaron Mills. So wait, what was the point of talking about K-pop? Is it the first one we use, or...? Well, it's the CX Kuka band. That's the name of the K-pop band. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, gotcha, gosh, gotcha. Yeah. Well, you know, Korean, they, you know, that's where, what is it, uh, Psy came from, right? Yeah, Gundam style. Yeah, Gundam style, so... And, and then, right now, the K-pop bands are very popular over there. Very popular. Same with the Japanese over there. They got J bands, I guess they call them. So we looked at general modem principles, types of forward uh, air correction, types of modulation, interleading, traditional based modems, and IP based modems. That is it. Two o'clock. Not bad. Any questions on what we've gone over? A lot of info, but hopefully it all process. Yes, and again, gentlemen, at the 
10 to 11 o'clock, you're more than welcome to come along. And if you got any questions, you know, ask them. I'm on there. Pop in at about, you know, if no one shows up between 10 and 10.15, then I'll hop off. But that doesn't necessarily mean that if you message me, I'll come back on. I am always there. All right. Let's do yes, sir. Or Alpha. Identify basic facts and principles, capabilities, limitations of line of sight radios. It should be pretty quick. And it'll be the end for the day. All right? Hmm, excuse me. Again, remember about the 70% on the test. You will deal with line of sight equipment. Now, this is different than the line of sight that you went over in block four. Block four kind of gave you the precursor to line of sight. Block four was, hey, put a vertical antenna up. You got vertical polarization. If you can see that antenna, you should be able to talk to it, which is line of sight, right? Now we're getting into, okay, I'm going to point a dish at you, and you're going to point a dish at me, and we really need to be talking to each other. If we're off or something gets in the way, you're going to have problems. So let's take a look at line of sight principles, repeaters, limitations of repeaters. So line of sight is no physical obstacles between the transmitting and receiving antennas. If there is, you're going to have interruption of service. So if you don't set your antennas up and hit the distant end with their antenna, you're going to have problems. No communication is going to happen. Gentlemen, this particular item is on your electronic C's and D's. It is page one of your C's and D's. It explains the radio horizon being 15% more farther than your optical horizon. Now, on this particular one, it does not show the bottom part where it shows the difference between the radio horizon and the optical horizon versus the true horizon. If you pulled your electronic C's and D's up, you would see that on the bottom of that on page one. You would see a couple arrows, one showing the true horizon to optical, or excuse me, radio horizon to optical, and then radio horizon to true horizon. Those two arrows are on the bottom part of that. I'm just kind of curious. Nope, won't work. I was hoping that i uh, take the crop off of it, and apparently they just eliminated it into one PNG file. Oh well. Again, this one is on your electronic C's and D's. Highly, highly suggest that you open those up after this particular segment and at least take a look at it. Okay, line of sight principles, typically 20 to 50 miles, 3 to 50 gig, should be like 3 megahertz to 50 gigahertz, but hey, you're dealing with line of sight here. Uh, 1 to 5 watts. With the Tisser, you're looking at about 25 uh, miles, less than 25 miles, and there's a reason why I say less than. We'll get into that on uh, probably Thursday. Okay, so this is typical line of sight, practical applications for it. The bottom line is because we're dealing with shooting it across the, let's say, the flight line or maybe a couple miles, the last thing that you want to do is dig for cable, especially if it's a new base. If it's a permanent base, yeah, you're going to do that. But 
if you're just a temporary base, why are you digging up, you know, earth in order to put your cable in it? So you use the line of sight radios to replace that cable. Now, also, <laughs> you don't want to be digging in the middle of, let's say, the mountainous areas because you don't have the equipment to do it. Also, how far do you need to go? Do you need to go 25 miles like the Tister's Max is? That's a lot of digging. A lot of digging. So it just goes to show you it's easier to use the line of sight radio than it is to use cables at times. Actually, most of the time. Now, how far, okay, for example, I told you the limitation of our Tister, which is less than 25 miles. In order for us to go beyond that radio horizon, we need to use something called repeaters. Again, this is on page two of your electronic C's and D's, and we're going to go over each of these. Repeaters have a transmitter and a receiver. They are full duplex. They must, they must do two functions. One of them is called frequency translations. What is frequency translation? Well, you're converting it from one frequency to another. I like to use conversion more than I like to use translation. Potatoes, potatoes. It also has to amplify because when it receives a signal, it's very weak. But when you retransmit it out, you got to have it back up to the normal operating wattage to get it to the distant end or it ain't going to work. There are four different types of repeaters. Again, this is all on page two with the first two types, which is an RF repeater and an IF repeater. The other two repeaters, which are a baseband repeater, that's what the Jerk 239 is capable of doing, and an audio repeater. Let's take a look at the RF repeater. Again, this is on page, I thought I Nope. I don't know where I put it. It's somewhere around here. But I have the breakout of the electronic C's and D's on paper. Got to find out where I put it. This is an RF repeater. What does it do? It takes RF and repeats it. You're going to still have amplification and translation. Not going to be very good because the distortion starts coming into play. Let's take a look at this. Grab an arrow. If you take a look at the receiver part, you can see four 400 megahertz being received into the de into the dish. We run it through an LNA at 440 megahertz because we've got to boost the power in order for us to translate it. We're going to run it through a mixer. You notice that we have a local oscillator. This is a difference of 260 megahertz to give us 4660 megahertz going into the high powered amplifier which is going to boost it up to the wattage that we need it at. So you've got Here's your frequency translation between those two frequencies, and then you have amplification of the two frequencies to be resent out. Again, frequency translation, amplification. Uh, let's copy this, go to the next page. With an IF repeater, we're going to break it down even more. You're still going to have to translate the RF and still amplify it, but because you're breaking it down, you can clean it up with the noise. Here's your frequency translation, 440 to 4660. Here's your amplification. So we met the two requirements of a repeater. 
it goes a little bit deeper. You take this, you amplify it because it's a weak signal, you down convert it using a local oscillator. You break it down into what's called the intermediate frequency. The intermediate frequency, because anytime that you down convert, the signal becomes even weaker. So you have to amplify it to where when you mix it again, you have enough signal strength to bring it into the high powered amplifier and get it up to the operational wattage that's going to go out. So there is the frequency translation and amplification in there. The next one is a baseband repeater. This is our Dirk 239 or Tisser as we call it. This one breaks it down into the multiplex signal. The multiplex signal is then repeated into another one and sent out. And that's that little scenario we told you about earlier about having the a phone set up in front of Foster's Manor run in through a multiplexer. The multiplexer would go into the tisser. The tisser would shoot the darn signal across the triangle area to the levitol. The levitol would use an another tisser and retransmit it to Jones Hall. Jones Hall would break it down into the multiplex signal, run it over to the satellite system. Satellite system in room 120 would shoot it up to the sat sim. Sat sim would shoot it back down to the other satellite system across the room run it into another multiplexer and you could talk from inside that room to Foster's Manor using that Tisser repeater system. Nice thing is you can do drops halfway through it. Next one is an audio repeater. This is a full duplex break it down into the original signal the back or the disadvantages to this is it is the most expensive system. Very expensive for it. So what are some limitations of repeaters? Well first of all you got to look at the equipment capability. What's the distance? Uh, and then of course you're looking at terrain. What's the needs of the communications network? So let me put this in a big hint here. The distance. How far do you really need to go with this signal? Goes all the way down to the needs of the communication network. Do you need it? Well, is it a want or is it mission requirements? The equipment capability that you're doing it with. Will it go the distance? And it goes all the way down to needs of the communication network. Am I, cover, am I doing it because I don't want to dig or am I doing it because the mission requires me to go over a mountaintop? Again, needs of the communication network. The big thing is, is if it needs it because of the mission, you're probably going to get the money or the equipment to cover the distance and the terrain. See how well that fits in there. If you are just using it because you want to have it, you're probably not going to get the money for it. Noise factor. You can see that we introduced you to something called frequency division multiplexing. It looks like you can only do eight links before your signal just literally can't handle the noise. Whereas TDM, which would be all the way down into the multiplex signal, like the baseband that we were talking about. Now that one's 15 links before noise becomes an issue. But if you're having to do 15 repeaters, you might want to look at your yeah, look at your equipment capability and might want to upgrade at that point. So we've looked at line of sight principles, repeaters, and limitations of repeaters. So what are the four repeaters we went over, Thomas? The four types of uh, repeaters. Mm-hmm. 
uh, IF, RF, baseband, and audio. Okay, let's see if uh, Senior Airman Bell can answer this one. Which one is the best one out of there? I can't hear you, Stevens, right now. Still no. Senior Airman Bell, you there? Quiznos, do you know? Which one is the best repeater? Drawing a blank. Anybody? Which one's the best repeater? Audio. Audio. Audio is. Which one is the worst one? RF. 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 Why is because it has the most distortion? distortion? Yep, has the most distortion. You beat me to the question. Oh, yeah. I just measured mine. Yeah, but a did. bing, but a boom. Carlos Amido, why is. Oh, thank you. Okay. So. We have all this information, the first three. Ah, Bell's finally coming on. Let's see if he can answer a question. So what are the four types of network synchronization? Four types of... Uh, network synchronization. I'm asking Senior Airman Bell. He's typing in there right now. I haven't picked on the two prior service lately, so it's my not sure. Quiznos, do you know? Four types of network synchronization, Quizno. Quinez. That's what it sounds like, Quinez. Four types of network synchronization. You drawn a blank too? Yeah. All right. Open ended question. Stevens, you know? You can type that in. Ah, he's writing. Let's see what he comes up with. Ah, uh, negative. Juarez, do you know? Um, just to make sure, we're talking about like, like, is one of them being a master clock? Yep. Oh, then the uh, master clock, master slave, and then um, this mutual is it? Yes. And then the other ones, uh, it's like a P word. Yeah, the Cronus. The dinosaur. All right, good, good. All right, so here's the way this is going to pan out. You have your homework from one alpha to. 2 alpha to send to me and I'll go through it real quick like to verify that you're doing it you have homework for tonight to do for tomorrow afternoon which will be 3 alpha through 4 alpha and again SIA tomorrow from between 10 to 11 if you you know if you have some problems with your homework please come on it's a great place to ask about the homework questions like Aaron Mills did today hopefully he got straightened out and we have class at 12:30 till whenever we'll be covering for Bravo and part of for Charlie is everybody clear on that 
Yes, sir. All right. We shall see you guys tomorrow, and have a wonderful night.